Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where the intelligence goes to my guest. In this case, Tagi Amarani, who has made an incredible documentary. And I know that sounds like wild endorsement, but really one of the most interesting political documentaries that I've seen. And I thought I knew a lot about the coup. The title is Coup 53. It's a reference to the U.S.-British overthrow of the last democratically elected leader of Iran, and it was done in the coup 53 in 1953. It brought Shah back to power. Uh, We had this royal uh, leadership of that country messing it up quite a bit, and but it allowed the British to come back and control their oil. That was the object of the exercise. And as a result, it led eventually to the uh, Shiite Islamic uh, uh, Ayatollahs who have been ruling uh, Iran ever since. And I want to say something about this. As being an old timer, I'm actually recording this when I just turned 87. The the seminal experience of my life, my youth, was really World War II. First, it was the Great Depression where I was born, World War II. And the enthusiasm, believe it or not, despite the horror of the tragedy, or maybe because of the horror of the tragedy of World War II, culminating in the dropping of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on the atomic bombs, uh, was the idea that colonialism and the era of colonialism, which had caused so much violence in the world and oppression, would be over. A UN, a United Nations of equal nations, would come into being, and they would go their own way to satisfy the needs of their people. It was a beautiful ideal which was violated almost from the first hour. And and this coup in in Iran is a reflection of that because the old colonial powers, both in, well, not just both, but in Vietnam, throughout Latin America, elsewhere, wanted to get back in power. And in the case, it was the British uh, lied with the United States and it was the Anglo-Iranian oil company that was alarmed that this guy Mossadegh had begun nationalizing the oil. And I think he began with the Italian oil company, but was moving fast to the Anglo-Iranian oil company, which we know these days is the British Petroleum Company. Messed up the environment uh, quite expansively. Uh, so I want to introduce you, but I want you to tell me your own personal journal journey in making this movie. Uh, how old are you? And you you are in Iran. That basically you were raised under the Ayatollahs. That you're evoking the image of this secular leader, Mohammed Mossadegh. And it's it's an incredible film. And I, I want to also talk about this difficulty and journey in getting it to the public. It was at Telluride. It was well received. Very famous people, uh, knowledgeable about the subject, have said it's an incredible contribution. Yet you're here in Los Angeles where I got to see it at the Lemley. I thank the Lemley for showing it. And we're going to show it at USC at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism this evening. Uh, But it it really has had a hard time getting out there. So tell us, you, your age, your origin, how you got in the film business, and how you came to make this really epic uh, two-hour documentary. Thank you, Bob, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about this film. The, the journey of the film, my own journey, and the journey of the film trying to get out to the audience is really intense, really full of crises and ups and downs. And uh, I was born in Iran. I didn't grow up under the Ayatollahs. I grew up under the Shah. Uh, I, By pure coincidence... When I, were you born? I was born in 1960. Oh. Uh, I am just coming up this September to my 63rd. Oh, if yeah. I may take the opportunity, can I just say happy birthday to you? Yes, yes. So uh, what uh, an uh, honor to be talking to you on your birthday. Uh, so you've really divided, devoted your adult life to well, a large part of it to this project. Yeah, I, I am now in my 14th year on this project. Yeah. Uh, it took 10 years to make. Project being coup 53, trying to unravel what happened to Iran. Very important country, out not only for the Mideast, the whole production of oil for the world economy, mm. and and you have, uh, we've all, a lot of us have known this story. Uh, people have written articles, a few very good books about it, but not the full story. And one reason I, I'm having you here, and because I, I I learned from your film, 
And I interviewed Kermit Roosevelt, this top CIA guy who had actually partially engineered this coup. I thought I knew a lot about it. That's when I worked at the LA Times. I interviewed him uh, 25 years after the fact, but still got the story. And uh, he actually ended up writing a book, which then confirmed a lot of that. But you really have got the mystery here, how it was done, and that really the Americans were involved, but the Brits getting their oil back. That was really the real drama. Oil trumped everything. British imperialism, uh, abetted by American neo-colonialism, did the trick. So take Absolutely. it from there. And well, how I, old, so you're 63. So you grew up mainly under the Shah. I, I was in Iran until I was 15. Uh, I left in 1975 purely by accident. It had nothing to do with the revolution. The revolution was just a glint in people's eye. Not even that. Um, you mean so the Islamic Revolution? Yeah. Yeah. So the 1979, uh, and uh, but the coup is such a decisive and pivotal moment in Iranian history. The way it turned everything inside out and has has, has had ripples not just through Iran uh, and Iranians' relationship with themselves and their place in the world, uh, but also way into the region and beyond. Um, it is a national scar. It hasn't gone away. Uh, it really shapes everything to this date. I grew up with the story because I heard my, he heard my family, the elders, talking about it late into the night. Uh, whenever they came to this word, they would whisper it. I was seven years old, and late into the night, they'd be sitting around chatting and say, blah, 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 blah. what's that? Blah, blah, blah. And I couldn't figure out why they're whispering this one word, and what is this word? I had no idea. Looking back, uh, putting the pieces together, I think it's when, when he died, and even talking about Mossadegh, even having his portrait or having his books, you could get arrested for that. So it was hush-hush. So the word had got well, out. This is under uh, a supposedly better government that the U.S. helped install. But if you wanted to know who was this democratically elected mm -hmm. leader who was overthrown with the work of the U.S. and, and the Brits, mm -hmm. uh, you could get arrested so much for freedom. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the irony is that Mossadegh, I believe, was the uh, one of the few Western educated uh, individuals in in uh, Iran at that time, and yeah. he got his doctorate. And so, t introduce him as a he he was uh, he was highly educated. He was probably one of the first Iranians to get a doctorate of law from a Swiss university. They celebrated the anniversary, the hundredth anniversary of of his PhD at Neuchâtel University. I went to that event. Um, and uh, he, for a very short window in Iranian history, from 1951, from the nationalization to the coup, Iran had a little baby democracy trying to get its feet. You know, there was press freedom. Uh, any, it was anything goes. Uh, and, and that was crushed uh, in 53, August 53. Mossadegh came to power as prime minister on two tickets, nationalizing Iranian oil and electoral reform because the whole election process, the parliament was rigged, it was very corrupt, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of bribery going on, the British were mainly dominating that whole uh, environment. The Anglo-Iranian oil company, which began as the Anglo-Persian oil company, became an Anglo-Iranian company, and then it became BP after the coup, uh, it wasn't just an oil company in the city of Abadan in the Khuzestan region. It really had its fingers in every pie right across Iranian society. It was like, almost like a state within a state. It had obviously the, the whole colonial mindset. Uh, Iranian workers were like second, third class citizens living in mud huts, whilst the, the, the expat British lived in glorious homes with you know, manicured gardens. Uh, they had the clubs, they had everything, all the facilities. And so he came to power on nationalizing Iranian oil as his main objective. Uh, and as soon as he did that, uh, relationship soured. Uh, the Anglo-Iranian oil company um, was about to lose its biggest asset. The Anglo-Iranian oil company was the biggest overseas asset of the British state. It was huge. Uh, it was selling Iranian oil across the world. It was running uh, the British Navy. In fact, Churchill converted the British Navy from coal to oil purely on the back of Iranian oil. So this was a huge lo potential loss to them. Right from the get-go, they decided he had to go. I mean, the, the idea that we had to get rid of this guy was right from the beginning, as soon as he nationalized, that was, that, that was the plan. So this idea that 
we had to get rid of him because he was a well, common. You know, you're skipping over some history and, and, and ha teaching at a university uh, here. I know history has been denied to us. I'm yes. not saying in a calculated way because it's mostly an inconvenient truth. Yes. That I recognize, well, what the hell were the Brits doing in Iran? We accept this as normal. We accept Western colonialism dominating the whole region as normal. So do a little that being their primary decade, education here. They were, they were there for a long time. They have a long, long kind of dark... They are the colonial powers yes. as they were in India. They were. Even though Iran wasn't officially part of the empire, it was very much treated as, as much. It was treated like, an, like a colony. It, it was everything you see in a colony but name. Right across. I mean, and, it, and they were there for decades, well, even before the discovery of oil in 1908. So they had like deep roots in Iran, um, and and the way they ran that city was the Abadan the refinery was like the Raj. They, in fact, they imported cheap Indian labor uh, over over the Iranians. And, and just to be clear about this, the Brits only survived World War II and were allowed to come back in because of U.S. power. The U.S. was presumably committed to some anti-colonial notion. It betrayed that in Vietnam. It betrayed it all over the place. Yeah. But here was the United States, beginning with uh, Harry Truman, uh, helping the Brits consolidate their power. And, uh, but they were a little hesitant about whether we actually should destroy the vestiges of a, or, or the appearance of an Iranian mm -hmm. civil society and government. Yeah. And so Mohammed Mosley was a confusing figure. And the way the U.S. got into it is the Brits were able to label Mohammed as maybe open to the Russians yeah. nearby, bring it into the Cold War. And as happened with Vietnam, is a very good example, later with Cuba, much later, but it happened throughout Latin America. Mm -hmm. If you could identify the popular nationalist movement, but somehow communism, mm -hmm. Then you could do anything you want to bring back the old colonial power. That's right. The, the communist bogeyman was a perfect cover story, uh, and in fact, Truman was sympathetic to Mossadegh's cause. He even, you know, told the British, you know, he has he has a right, you know, to respect their sovereignty, come to some arrangement, and 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 Mossadegh put a lot of faith in Truman. They get on they got on really well. Uh, it was when the you know the tables turned and, and Eisenhower came to power that Mossadegh didn't see coming. He didn't have enough understanding of the ways of American politics and how, how the whole thing had changed with the Dulles brothers coming in. Uh, but right up to end of uh, Truman's term, he thought he had an ally that was going to stand up to the, to the Brits. Uh, and even though they tried to persuade the Americans to come in on the coup, Truman wouldn't go for it. Things, t things changed. And as we see in the film, uh, even before Eisenhower is inaugurated, as soon as he's elected, Churchill is in the U.S. having discussions about this plan. Um, That's 52, yeah. 1952. That's right. And, and by the way, Eisenhower learned some painful lessons from this because by the time he left office, mm -hmm. he knew that we were con getting increasingly controlled by a military-industrial complex and this That's extension of war and empire was a betrayal yeah. of the promise of peace after mm. World War II. So here we have really the critical... The reason your movie is so important, Coup 53, mm -hmm. is it all goes south. Mm -hmm. It all sours, if you like that better, mm -hmm. with this coup. Yeah. Because this ushers in decades of meddling, overthrowing, uh, subversion yeah. of nationalist aspirations and indeed, in this case, democratic aspirations mm -hmm. throughout the world. Yeah. And a model is created that the U.S. thinks is successful they go one up on the Brits now. It's not just Iran. We can do this everywhere. We do it in Guatemala. We do it in Cuba. We'll do it in Vietnam, uh, such as that's the Vietnam War, based on the ease or the success of this coup in Iran. Yeah, yeah. It emboldened the CIA uh, to repent, uh, repeat and rinse. It became a template. It was almost like pull out the plan, cross out Iran, put in Guatemala, cross out, you know, put it in Chile. And, and so I, I do want uh, I promise I always promise I'll listen as I'll shut up. But I do <laughs> want to mention I actually have some connection with this because Kermit Roosevelt, who was the at least rumored to be at that time, but he probably was the chief 
U.S. agent, CIA agent on the scene. Mm-hmm. When I interviewed him, I was at the L.A. Times. I got his, my wife uh, found, uh, who was the weekend editor, Narda Zacchino. She said, why don't you interview somebody you really want to? I wanted to interview him. She found his name, believe it or not, in the Washington, D.C., the old-fashioned phone book. Uh, I called him. Uh, uh, he was in the hospital, but he could talk. His wife gave me the room number. And he did say, and he did say in his book that came out later, that he did not see this as a model for intervention all over the world. He thought this was a big disaster. Mm-hmm. He, he worked there for special reasons, and you can describe them here. Mm-hmm. He said, but he didn't think it would work elsewhere. Right. And yet it became, as you say, the template. Yeah. In fact, there's a letter from Alan Dulles. When Kermit gets back from Iran, there's a, yeah, we, can, we can actually see it in the archives. There's a letter from uh, Alan Dulles saying, congratulations, good job. Have a good rest. Come in on Monday. I've got some other ideas. Let's talk some. I've got another idea. And, and yes, uh, Kermit is on the record in an interview I've seen, which he says, well, th- this was a very special set of circumstances. Certain elements have to be in place for this work to work. You can't just simply transplant this plant everywhere all the time. Um, I had to make this film. I had to get it off my chest. Uh, I wasn't mature enough or experienced enough as a filmmaker uh, before I started this, because I've only just done television documentaries. So this is my first feature-length movie. Uh, and the journey began in 2009. Uh, I had read Stephen Kinzer's book. And the moment I finished the book, I thought, that's going to be my first... You know, let's pay credit to that. Stephen Kinzer really is the journalist who took the lid off this story. Yeah. And did incredibly All the Shah's Men. Yeah. Incredible. It's a great nonfiction thriller, page-turner, and it really takes you through. And he's uh, in your movie. In a and he's way. one of the key commentators. We have three really incredible commentators, historians, who are like the backbone of the film, along all the other interviewees and archive and everything else that we have. It's kind of multi-layered, very kind of tightly woven, thanks to Walter Murch's editing, masterful editing. So there's Stephen Kinzer, there's David Talbot, uh, there's uh, Professor Irvan Abrahamian, and Malcolm Byrne. Uh, from the National Security Archives. Yeah, and David Talbot, who had been the editor of Salon, uh, wrote the definitive work on Alan Dulles, the big the Devil's CIS Chessboard. Book, the Devil's Chessboard, yeah. an incredibly solid yeah. contribution. Throw that in. We were very well served by these brilliant commentators and historians and great storytellers, too. Um, it was going to be a narrative fiction when I read All the Shah's Men, and I tried to option it and... Stephen said, somebody else has the option, it's not available, and come back if it expires and he has done nothing with it. But in my research, I found Mossad Dev's head of security, the bodyguard. Uh, he was in, in his early 80s. Uh, he happened to be visiting his son, who's a heart surgeon in Calabasas, uh, to see his grandchildren. I found out, I drove up the hill, uh, sat down, interviewed him on camera for eight hours, and by the uh, end of that interview, I found him so compelling, so vivid, so such an incredible witness and so fresh. He, he talked about the events as if that happened, happened to him yesterday. And, and I thought, why would I get actors to be in a narrative fiction movie on this? I've got the real witness here. Let's find more of them. And there were a handful left, all in their 80s. There was a, a matter of urgency of timing. Get them before they die. And we managed to get most of them. And, and so the f- it became the documentary it became. Um, nobody wanted to fund this film. Uh, nobody would touch it. I tried every single source of funding that documentary makers go to. Uh, I'd, I'd been an experienced documentary maker as a television filmmaker, so I knew where you go for money if you're doing, make, doing something like this. Rejected across the board. I had to raise the money in donations, dollar by dollar, uh, and that's why it took so long, uh, because the money would run out. In retrospect... It was a blessing because the longer it took to raise money, the longer we had to research and dig deep and find more people, find more archive, find more footage. So um, it was a blessing when people pulled out and you know, I had to go around chasing money and research. Um, I got very, very lucky. Uh, I always say at my introductions uh, for the screenings, I am not the best documentary maker, but I'm very, very, very lucky, probably the luckiest documentary maker in getting the great Walter Murch. Uh, to join this project. He thought he'd sign up for six months to work on this little documentary. For people who don't know him, you should mention... Walter Murch. He he worked with Coppola and everybody. uh, Yeah, he's uh, worked with Francis Ford Coppola. He's actually a USC graduate. Ah. 
Uh, and I know you shouldn't name drop because everybody here is huge. That's what we do. We name drop. You name drop. Okay, so Walter is a USC graduate along with George Lucas, Caleb Deschanel. There was a very special group of people in the early 60s who came out of USC, uh, joined up with Frances, who was at UCLA, and they decamped to uh, San Francisco because they didn't want to do Hollywood. Bless them. Good for them. Um, so Walter brought his um, amazing wealth of experience, you know, 50 years in motion pictures, countless Oscars and BAFTAs. And um, he moved to London because they had a house. He'd, he's edited films in London before, that had a little house. So they signed up for six months. Walter ended up staying on this project for four years. I spent four years in the cutting room, more time than I've spent with anybody in a room in my life. Uh, and and I s at the Walter Murch University. This is an unscripted film. It's an unscripted. We didn't know what we were going to find. It, it was just evolving. We just kept finding stuff. We shut down. We researched. We started again, and that changed the story as we were making it. Uh, and which is why it's important for filmmakers out there. If you ever work uh, with an editor on an unscripted documentary, you must credit the, the editor as co-writer, because the writing of the movie happens in the editing. The editing is essentially writing it backwards. Well, as long as we're giving credit, you should give credit to a terrific, the National Security Archive in, in Washington. Absolutely. Uh, which is a privately funded yep. uh, organization that does a lot of the freedom of information inquiries. Yep. And so for people listening to this, the reason I was blown away by this is you solved the mystery. Yeah. Uh, I, I am one of... <laughs> Dozens of people who had a piece of it, yeah. uh, and I certainly applaud uh, Tinzer and Talbot and others who did the really heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. But there was a real mystery: yeah. who, who was, how did was it organized? Okay. And they went in there, they bribed people, they got the mob going, they created a coup. We've seen other coups, yeah. and the CIA did it, but the CIA didn't do it alone. Mm -hmm. uh, M5, the Brits, MI6. Who were, M, M, I'm sorry, six. Uh, we're we're uh, getting the oil <laughs> back yep. for uh, g uh, the glory of, of England, and and so tell us because mm -hmm. you and then you used a fictional character because you didn't have video of the actual character, so introduce. Let me uh, tell you about the, the the magnificent performance by Rafe Fiennes. Uh, so uh, backtrack a bit. Um, this has been known even to me when I started working on it, as the CIA coup, Kermit Roosevelt coup. It was always, this is the CIA coup in Iran. Uh, in fact, in 2013, through Malcolm Byrne, more declassified papers came out on the 60th anniversary uh, of the coup. Uh, but this wasn't by design. It was purely a, a lucky break. Uh, we find this amazing, amazing, extraordinary interview that the MI6 officer who ran the coup, wrote the plan for the coup. He was the mastermind. He co-wrote the plan for this coup with Donald Wilbur uh, from the CIA, under the, who was an academic but also a spy. Uh, and in this interview, he blows the lid off the whole story and how he did it. He was completely in charge, all the minutiae of the planning, the bribing, <coughs> the, the court control of the mob. Uh, Derbyshire was a 19-year-old soldier who went to Iran in 1947. And he knew Iran inside out. He spoke Persian. He was very, very streetwise, really savvy. He wasn't your classic colonial pinstripe-suited Oxbridge diplomat. That wasn't, that wasn't his scene. He actually talks disparagingly about the, the British diplomats at the embassy having cocktail parties while he's out there mixing with the people getting to know Iran and Iranians. So this interview turned the whole story inside out for us because then it emerged that he ran the school. He was in charge. Through him and through his planning, they dragged the CIA in. The, the CIA was a relatively new organization then. It hadn't gone off campus. It hadn't played out in the field like the British had before. And, and the way they brought the CIA and the Americans in was present Mossadegh as a communist threat. Iran was going to get swamped and taken over by, by the Russians. And we have to save Iran from communism. Nothing about oil. It wasn't, please help us get our oil back. Please let us get rid of this common enemy, Mossadegh, and communism. And that worked. That, that paranoid state of 1950s America, they hit the right buttons. He had given this interview to a British television... Well, with no evidence that he was a communist. He wasn't. He was, yes. he was, he was, he was the least likely yeah. communist. Yeah. Um, you know... Uh, 
he just had a belief that people are free to organize. If they want to publish their papers, they can. There was, a, there was amazing freedom of the press in those 28 months of Mossadegh's rule, very short time. A tiny little glimpse of what democracy might have evolved in Iran had it been allowed to go on and not lead to the explosion of the 79 revolution. We found the Darbisha transcript very late in the day. I mean, uh, you couldn't make this up. The producers who made this documentary and interviewed Darbisha uh, didn't or couldn't use the interview in their film. Now, we can, ex we can explore the, 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 the minutiae of that whole story of why. This is prior to your film. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is a 1985 British television documentary, a series called End of Empire, 14 parts. It's all about the unfolding and unwinding of the empire, different countries. Even though Iran wasn't part of the empire, it was dominated by British interests for so long. They included a program on Iran and the coup. So it became part of the you know, end of empire series, the Iran episode. The Iran episode is notorious because the most incendiary, amazing revelations in their interviews, not just Darvishes, they didn't put in their film. We have all the transcripts. When the production finished, the researcher from the program, instead of dumping all the production papers and research papers that were about to trash them, Mossadegh's grandson, Hedam Atin Daftari, was an advisor, historic advisor on this program. And, and when it, they finished, they said, well, you, it's, you, it's basically this is your granddad's story. Would you like these papers? And he said, sure. He took them away, put them in his basement in Paris. They sat there for 34 years until Taghi Amirani showed up. And he, you see in the film, I take this pile of papers, I take him back to London, and leafing through them, I'm, a, I'm blown away by the content. These are research notes, original transcripts, everything they've got. And among them is this remarkable historic document, the original interview transcript with Norman Derbyshire with his name on it, with the director's note at the top right in pencil with his initial M.A., Mark Anderson, it says, excellent, if we want the coup in detail, and even if not, that interview blew me away, and it was cut up, the old school of film structure, you know, you literally had to cut and paste to create a script. There were big bits missing, and in the same pile, there is the intact interview. There is, like, uncut with his name redacted. You piece it together, and then you find out the things he said. And at first you think, okay, why isn't this in their film? What's the story? Why is everybody else in their film? But he's not in the finished film. That's a key question. And we found out by, by luck that the British Film Institute archives kept all the outtakes. Uh, they they preserve archive for historic reasons for the nation. Uh, we went to the BFI. We found all the other interviews. They were in cans, old cans sitting there. We cleaned them. We paid for it. We actually helped them clean and preserve this. We digitized it. We were the first to digitize those interviews. And we couldn't find Derbyshire. And fast forward, as I don't want to, it's, it's also, I don't want it's a plot spoiler. It's, it becomes a bit of a thriller. A lot of the reviews. Well, your movie, Coup 53, is a great mystery story. Yeah. And you have a terrific actor playing the missing person here. Yeah. yeah. When we couldn't find the audio tape or the film, if they filmed him, uh, we thought, right, we've got to bring this to life. And again, Walter Murch, the greatest gift of gods of cinema to this film, he knew Rafe Fiennes from his work on The English Patient, uh, and they were in touch. And one day, we were thinking of which actor, which actor, and we were going for lunch, and Walter says, what about Rafe Fiennes? And immediately, the light bulb moment, he said, of course, Rafe plays M in the fake James Bond spy movie. He's head of MI6 as a character in James Bond. Let's get him to be a real MI6 officer. And, and this idea evolved over a, a few days. Rather than get him to just read or be in the studio, let's take him back to the location where End of Empire interviewed other interviewees for the series, the Savoy Hotel. Uh, and that's how that amazing scene with Rafe bringing Darbyshire's words to life happens. And he, he, he electrifies the film. People forget his Rafe finds. Three minutes into the film, they think that's Darbyshire. Well, and it, it's a breakthrough, and you're using the actual text of, of 
yeah. what he said. Now, there is uh, something of a disclaimer at the end of the movie. Yes. So you should explain that. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, this is a fascinating story post-release of this film, uh, which we are documenting and uh, been filming, and it's going to be part of a sequel, potentially called Coup 53.1. And we made the film, it came out, and it was out in the world for a year, and End of Empire didn't make a noise, said nothing. It was around a festival circuit for a year. It went to 30 festivals, world premiere, tell you what. It played at the London Film Festival. It was nominated for a Grierson Award. It, it was played at the British Independent Film Awards. Nothing, not a peep squeak. As soon as the film was self-released in August 2020, and we had to self-release because no distributor would touch it, uh, it got wall-to-wall -wall coverage, incredible coverage from all the uh, main papers, you know, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, we were on NPR, uh, the London Times, Telegraph, everywhere. It was, you were on BBC five times, Channel 4 News. It became a story. The Guardian wrote a story about the Derbyshire transcript on the day we released the transcript to the National Security Archive. We actually gave the transcript to Malcolm Byrne, even though End of Empire had done it and never released it. Never without that. It, it had been given to writers, it was in other books, but it, it was very niche and specialist. So until we brought it out in full, it wasn't known. It, did, it wasn't obvious what, what, what it contained. And we were threatened with a lawsuit by the producers of End of Empire, two of whom are actually featured in the film, are on the screen in our film. Their claim is that our film defames them and stains their reputation as upstanding journalists by implying that they filmed him put him in their film, had to take him out under pressure, and so they cooperated with censorship, and this, this puts a stain on their re reputation, and for that, they threatened to sue us. The amazing thing is, they never sued us. They never even hired lawyers. Uh, we didn't even get a letter from a lawyer anytime, anyone, anytime. They just put it out there. They created a cloud of smoke and mudslinging on this film. Um, I now, by coincidence, uh, the New Yorker has published only in this week's edition, I don't know if you can see this, the smear campaign industry. I read this article yesterday on a plane from Washington to LA. Everything in that article was like a holy mother of Jesus, that's what happened to me. That's what happened to our film. This was such a coordinated smear campaign to make sure this film is discredited, is derailed, is pushed aside and distributors won't touch it. Uh, so that's why we put those disclaimers in the film because uh, you know we have to let the audience know what they say. Thanks to them, that makes the film stronger. People watch that and chuckle and say, oh yeah, right. <laughs> uh, they even managed to get the cameraman who shot End of Empire, was in our film, is in our film, saying he remembers Derbyshire vividly because he had such an impact. I remember him because he really was astonishing. That's why I remember him. Two years afterwards, after his interview, they got him to change his story, saying, sorry, I, I, I made a mistake. I was suffering from false memory. Um, when we were talking to our lawyers who'd seen the film, they said, Humphrey Trevelyan is the most believable witness if I put him in a dock. In a dock. That, that guy is so believable. And I feel sorry for him because I think he's a dignified, respected man. And uh, what I don't know what happened to him, but he came out two years after the film's uh, release saying. Yeah, so, th but the point is uh, in the film, it, it's very, first of all, it, the real issue here, and we shouldn't distract from it, is that there, there's no question, and it's been well documented now in book after book, and frankly, I don't want to intrude myself, but I think my article for the uh, Los Angeles Times based on a clear interview he never uh, not only did he not disagree with my interview recounting the CIA role but he wrote a book yeah uh, you know in fact it's in a few college libraries uh, his book taking credit for it and the CIA actually had a an event in which they thanked him and it became the model for intervention so yeah. I don't want to lose that thread no. uh, that yes this particular production in England should have done more with this material. They obviously cut it from yeah. their 
program and that that leaves them with, I guess, some egg on their face. But that's not really the issue here. Sure. The issue is uh, that this was treated as a great success yep. and a victory for democracy because in the Cold War, we stopped this guy, Mohammed Mossadegh. He would have been an ally of mm-hmm. the Soviets. Of course, none of that was true. The evidence is quite clear. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, as I can be a witness here when I talk to Kermit Roosevelt, he was very clear that. Uh, you know, that is, was a successful yeah. CIA operation. He played down the role of the Brits. You have stressed the role of the Brits uh, uh, much more. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the real issue is that it became the post-World War II model yeah. for attempting to control history mm-hmm. at the price of nationalism on the part of different countries, yeah. whether it was Indian nationalism, Vietnamese nationalism, or any other, uh, the real problem here Mm -hmm. was that they, in fact, were trying to control history. And ironically, given that oil is now seen as a great enemy of the survival of human beings, fossil fuel, this was all an attempt to pump oil in the Middle East uh, with abandon and make an enormous amount of money. Uh, And uh, as I recall the history, it actually... They didn't first go after the Brits. They went after an Italian oil company. I forget the So initials. the story was, yeah. that's right. Um, when, the, when, when Mossadegh nationalized oil, the Brits had to leave. The, the first thing they did was put an oil embargo uh, on Iranian s- selling of oil. In fact, they put adverts in international newspapers saying, if you buy Iranian oil, you're buying a lawsuit. And they were very sort of forceful on this. Two countries defied the British, and bless them, we love them, the Italians and the Japanese. In fact, they took the Japanese to court and lost because the Japanese sent a tanker uh, to Abadan to load up Iranian oil in defiance of the British embargo. They had their warships in the Persian Gulf, and when the Italians sent a ship, uh, the Mary Rose, they tried to torpedo and sink it. They arrested the captain. Um, and this was during you know the time of uh, Enrico Mattei and uh, and the and, and you know the whole Seven Sisters stories, so they yeah they try to derail the whole thing first through financial s- sanctions embargo, s- destabilizes government, make the economy weak weak so he, he would just <coughs> fall with the Iranian people being dissatisfied with the way the country is run and the and the harsh economy. Uh, it evolved into the whole military coup idea later. After he kicked the British out, he shut down the British embassy. And uh, now the Kermit story is he didn't speak Persian. He was in Iran for three weeks. He was a bit of an adventurist and a bit of a fantasist. His book has been described in different circles as partly fiction. And in fact, his book and his climb to fame as the mastermind of this coup, dining out, getting endless contracts, getting on talk shows, Having kind of audience with a shah, getting and you know really making money, uh, and meanwhile Darbusha, who ran this, this is his gig, isn't allowed by the British to say anything. He's not even allowed to exist, to, so anyone knows who he is. And so until 1983, when we can we can debate what drove him to do it. It, it could be endless reasons. He goes rogue. He spills the beans. Uh, and that, and you, if you read the transcript, by the way, the transcript. Well, the same thing I want to say. The same thing happened with Kermit Roosevelt in a way, mm-hmm. because when I w- interviewed him, <laughs> and as I say, it was you know, twenty-five years after the event. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, by the way. yeah, and uh, and I was I was working at the Los Angeles Times, and it was a, a great breakthrough mm-hmm. story because I got the CIA guy. You, you're right. He might have been exaggerating. Yes. Uh, the CIA's, uh, uh, as opposed to the British role, they certainly cooperated. Mm-hmm. But I know I mean, so there's an old saying, never hustle a hustler, which kind of can apply to journalism. And I thought, wow, this is great. I've gotten this great story mm-hmm. out of this guy. And there was no question he was not drugged up. He was in the hospital. Yeah. But he was very clear. His wife told me he'll be very eager to talk to you, because I told her what I was after. Yeah. I wanted to know, you know, uh, how this coup happened. She said, oh, I'm sure he'll talk to you. The reason she was sure, she knew we had a book coming out. That's right. I didn't know that. Yeah. You know, so uh, 
I thought, okay, this is great. We're having an interesting conversation. It all held up, yeah. you know, as far as what he said. And then uh, several months later, the book came out. Yeah. And that's why I understood I had been used by him to advance. You were his marketing campaign yes, manager. Yes, I was part of his marketing. And you know the story However, about the book, don't you? No. Uh, I mean, first off, the title is telling. It's Counter Coup. So it's not a coup. We staged a coup against Mossadegh, who yeah. was trying to stage a coup. So that's one thing. Yeah. And the, first, the other story that Malcolm Byrne can explain in much better detail than me, the first time the book comes out, Somewhere in there, he says, the, the coup was the idea of British Petroleum, who then got CI, uh, MI6 on board to run it. British Petroleum threatened to sue the publisher and Kermit. They had to go and pulp thousands and thousands of copies of that book and reprint it, in which they take that bit out where it says it was a Brit British Petroleum's idea. Somewhere out there, in some library, there is the original copy of Counter Coup, in which he says it was a BP's idea. So and, and there was was a change of a photograph, as I recall, in the first version and the second. Right. There was some parody of Hitler or something. Okay. Uh, Is that I, part uh, of the propaganda? Yeah. Yeah. But um, I I, I want to be clear for people listening to this why it's important mm -hmm. because the whole period of the post uh, World War II um, uh, period was the destruction of a of a oh, okay a, a, a grand ideal and the grand ideal was to empower the people of the world mm -hmm. now that we had defeated the the monster of germany and japan the mm -hmm. you know these despotic evil people correctly mm -hmm. who wanted to conquer the world japan would conquer mm -hmm. asia germany and then there everybody always leaves italy out of it the yeah. mussolini would help we now are going to liberate a, time, a world in which ordinary people were going to be able to express themselves mm -hmm. and define their nation, mm -hmm. right? And this would be true in India, would be true in Vietnam, would be true in Guatemala, would be true everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then we decided that's a little bit risky. Uh, we want to control the action because yeah. the bad guys are going to get in. The new bad guys were the Soviets and Russia or something. Yeah. So we have to prevent, we have to control this exercise. Mm -hmm. And Iran, the coup of 53, stands. That's why I'm justifying our spending all this time on mm -hmm. it and getting people to watch your film. This was the test case. This was, you know, can you control this, this challenge yeah. to colonialism, this nationalism, yeah. in a way that will support the U.S. position in the Cold War yeah. and make it a world safe for, dare I say it, American and British capitalism, yeah. you know, because we don't want anti-colonialism associated with nationalizing American corporate assets. Absolutely. That was the danger of Mossadegh, not that he was some kind of Bolshevik, but rather he was a guy who thought, amazingly enough, what Saudi Arabia now argues, came to argue, and everybody else that they, they had one thing going from there over there in Iran. They actually had a lot. They had a wonderful complex culture and history. But the fact of the matter is economically, they were going to become players through their oil. Yeah. And so therefore, they had a national interest in controlling their oil. This is the same thing Saudi Arabia ended up ar arguing. They had a 50-50 uh, deal with the whole Aramco business. Yeah. Uh, also, the other thing with Mossadegh was that he was, he was an inspiration to other anti-colonialists. In fact, he was an inspiration for Nasser, uh, which led to the, uh, the, the Suez Canal crisis, and they didn't want him to be a model for other people in the region. Um, and so that's, uh, that was the other reason. Going back to Kermit, he was, he was involved. He played a part. He was a bag man. He flew out there with a fake passport and was the carried suitcases of cash. He oh, he told me that in great detail. In fact, he was so proud. He said, I didn't even have to spend it all. You know? Yeah, you see, you see now I've dug, you've seen our film. You know the, the amount of depth of research we go into. I found three different interviews in which you can tell this guy makes it up. Uh, in one interview, which is in the film, it says, I had a million dollars and I spent about 60. In another interview, British television, I can show you the footage. He says, it was $700,000 and I spent only 10. So th th it's a moving target what he actually spent. So yeah. take take from that what you will about. Well, but also there were other pieces operating, as you point out, the British 
yeah. secret operation and where was the Shah and how do you move this person back and who is going to be the new prime minister. So you had these very sophisticated Western spy agencies yes. doing this. And, and Kermit Roosevelt, I, I feel, yes, he basically took money into the bazaar yeah. and, and to bribe people in the moment. Rent a mob. Yeah, rent a mob. mob. And, and that was his uh, chutzpah. Yeah. <laughs> his, <laughs> that he, he, we, and maybe, that maybe you can do that for 60000 yeah. in a specific day in the bazaar. You can get the yeah. uh, old weightlifting or wrestlers bodybuilding club bodybuilding. and get other hooligans and they'll go out in the streets yeah. and, uh, and so forth. But the, the real issue here was, and, and here I will defend Kermit Roosevelt, by the way, uh, uh, you know, related to, uh, uh, the, to Teddy Roosevelt, uh, but I, w- I would defend him. He, in his book, very and in my interview with him, he said, I did not, I, and now maybe he's not even being honest there, but he did say, I told him, you just can't just go and do this in Guatemala or sure. Vietnam or Cuba mm-hmm. or something because there was specific, specific circumstance in Iran that we could take advantage of. Yes. And part of that, by the way, is that British intelligence and uh, was already working very extensively. And so... They'd done the legwork. Yeah, they, you know. they'd done it. And so Kermit could come in with his bags of cash and say, hey, yeah. this is easier than I thought it would be. Yeah. Derbyshire had laid the groundwork. They'd done all the hard work. They had the networks. They knew the culture. They knew... And in fact, when the first attempt of the coup fails... Kermit kind of loses his nerve. In fact, there's a, there's a telegram from Washington saying, we've lost, Mossadegh has won, pack up and get out of there. And, and it's actually, you know, that's where the Derbyshire thing kicks in. He turns it around. He, he's the one who makes it a success. The turnaround of the coup spins on Derbyshire's taking initiative, getting his own renter crowd out. And, um, and that's why the interview with Derbyshire is significant. The other th- significant thing is that to this day, the British government, the British state, has not officially admitted that it was involved in this coup, that it played a leading part. It's not declassified. It's not talked about. It's like, you know, hear no evil, speak no evil. The Americans, bless them, they have come clean. Uh, Even Obama uh, acknowledges this coup in his 2009 speech in Cairo to the Muslim world. You know, Uh, Clinton has talked about it. Madeleine Albright has talked about it. Uh, And papers have come out. The Frost Report has come out. Uh, the British even tried to crush the first report and redact it the first time it was com- coming out because they want to take the, all the, Briti- the British role out of it. It finally came out in 2017 during our production. Um, and if you see that this whole story of the British not owning up through the prism of Derbyshire's interview disappearing and not being used in that film, then it pieces begin to make sense. Uh, you know, End of Empire say he gave an off-the-record interview on audio tape only. I mean, how do you go off the record in a recording of your voice? This is a seasoned spy. This is a man who really knows his work. His, you know, that, that's what he does. And he's saying the most incendiary stuff on tape. He knows he's on the record. You cannot be off the record if you're recorded. So none of this stuff that End of Empire have been throwing at our film makes sense. There are so many holes in this. It's bigger than a Swiss mountain yeah. cheese. Yeah, okay, but again, let me conclude on this. But with a, the thread of the story is, and which is now by now become, and your movie sort of is the definitive uh, work up to this point. And you, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you, uh, 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 I guess it's called research. Very liberally help yourself to, uh, you know, a great deal of documentation and so let's just end on what is very clear. Uh, the politics uh, central trouble zone of the world, if you like, uh, if we think of 9-11 and everything else and the wars and the never-ending wars, uh, going back to the first Suez and right on, mm-hmm. uh, has to do with uh, grabbing this precious resource of the Middle East, the oil, and letting it dominate everything else, and then you, with this mischief mm-hmm. and grab, you create great tragedy in the world, a great instability, and including severe economic problems, and ultimately a dependence upon fossil fuel that ends up threatening the very existence of life on this planet. Yeah. All of which is encapsulated in this 
uh, odd spy drama that you have documented. And at the heart of it is the mischief making of, yes, two intelligence operations that of the United States. Let's not let the CIA off the hook here. No, no, no. And they've actually fessed up to a, g- a good part of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and the British, which had a more direct economic interest. Yep. And they're bringing back British, now called British Petroleum. I hope I don't get sued over that, but they're uh, bringing back uh, the Anglo-Iranian uh, or Persian oil company. And, and so the crass economic motive uh, created enormous chaos for yeah. the world. We have documents in which the Americans are talking to the British before the coup, saying, we need some of this oil t- in order to help you. They were carving out Iranian oil before agreeing to come and help the British. And that's evident in the fact that after the coup, the BP is broken up, there's a consortium. They only get 40%, they used to have 100%, and they have to share Iranian oil with American and European oil companies. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because so, that's... It was, give us some oil, we'll help you. Yeah, and if you think about it, probably the troubles around Iran Mm -hmm. uh, have been at the center of a good part of the troubles in this world. And it's it's an irony that, after all, the whole hope of the formation of the UN in the post-world period was that the end of colonialism could be managed in a way that would liberate people to control their resources. Mm -hmm. Instead... You have this mischief making on a grand yeah. level. So I want to thank you, Tari Amarani, for telling us about your film. It's called Coup 53. 53. Is this going to still be in more theaters? Or well, you know, uh, four years win? after its release at Telluride Film Festival, we still have no distribution. You're looking at the distributor of this film. I go from theater to theater uh, and make connections with the programmers and and the Lamley have been amazing. Greg Lamley has been brilliant uh, by programming it. The Roxy in San Francisco is actually showing tonight at the Roxy. Uh, Act One Cinema in London, amazing. They, they, they programmed one show, it sold out. Programmed another one, it sold out. They're having two shows on the same night. They keep adding and I think we're going to build something. And you had it in Washington this week. We had it at the American uh, Film Institute Silver Theater la- uh, on Sunday night. An incredible Q&A, the most engaged audience we've had in a long time, the best questions. I was blown away. Well, and you had John Kiriako, a former CIA agent who revealed the uh, existence of torture and, yeah. and, and by the CIA. And tonight, at, uh, you know, we're going to have a screening here at the Annenberg School uh, for yeah. Communication and Journalism uh, at uh, USC, mm-hmm. University of Southern California, and you and John Kiriako are both speaking at this and so uh finally we're we're learning this history that then we have i want to thank you for doing that i want to thank laura condigerian and christopher ho at kcrw the npr station excellent one in santa monica for posting uh these podcasts i want to thank joshua sheer our executive producer who puts it all together diego ramos who writes the introduction max jones who does the video function and I want to thank Sebastian Gruba here at the Annenberg School uh, for being a terrific producer of these tapes that we very often can use at these excellent facilities. And I overall want to thank the JKW Foundation, which in the memory of, um, tribute to the memory of Gene Stein, a terrific journalist, writer, uh, for providing some funding for these shows. See you next week with another edition of Sheer Intelligence.